All right. So yeah, Salt Lake City Python. Um, went through the history. Oh yeah, so our affiliates, we have Utah Python North. They're located in Logan. Um, there are a bunch of other Utah Python uh, meetups around. Definitely check out their sites. This is all in the Etherpad. We have a few websites that need some updating. So if you're looking for some spring cleaning work to do, just hit us up and we can tell you what needs uh, pull requests. And uh, we actually got one for the Utah Python, finally, uh, where we updated and added the uh, uh, Python at the Point, the South Valley group, and they are officially listed via a pull request uh, on that site. Uh, sponsors, Pythonistas like you. Thank you so much for your continued support. At the moment, we are uh, still figuring out our donation process. It's probably going to be through Venmo, but we'll need to set up our own account for that. So that's TBD, because we can't really take cash anymore uh, for obvious reasons. Xmission has been a great sponsor for our pizza. Uh, I don't know how to send pizza to every one of you wherever you are, but we'll figure something out. Uh, maybe everybody should just eat pizza in solidarity. University of Utah, right now it's suspended, of course, as a venue, but they've been our venue for, what, two, two plus years. Um, and we're just going to go by their queue on when we can get that venue back. Uh, and Tech Systems has sponsored a number of our raffle prizes. Tech Systems is a recruiter, but they tend to actually know who they're trying to recruit. So we appreciate their sponsorship. If your company is looking to sponsor, please hit us up. Um, most of our expenses should be logged. I think all of them are, are up to date on SLC Python slash money. So we do open accounting. If you do donate, you're hidden anonymous. If you want to be by default, actually you are. And yeah, uh, we're tax deductible as well. So just hit us up and we can give you more details. Um, next thing we like to do is get a sense of who are our new members. So if you can just like raise your hand if you're a new member, and by raise your hand, I mean use the reaction because there's more people than the gallery will show right now. Scott is kind of like ifing his hand. John, you're new. Ryan, you're new. All right, anybody else who's new? Two participants raise their hand. Doesn't tell me who. I'm just like looking. I don't use Zoom that much, apparently. Oh, here we go. Mark and Stuart also raised their hand. Excellent. So we're going to actually say uh, you get to introduce yourself to the group. If you could uh, tell us who you are, what you're currently doing. Um, if you're not based in Salt Lake City or Utah, we definitely want to know. And then uh, the last book that you read. So Scott, I'm going to kick it off with you because you gave me the the eh hand, so. Uh, yeah, so I think this is my second or third, or second meetup I've been to with this group. Um, I live in Salt Lake. Uh, I work remotely for a company in Chicago. Um, we do a lot of um, recommendation systems and deep learning attribute labeling on fashion products. Um, Sorry, what are all the things I'm supposed to answer? Oh, and what's the last book you read? Ooh, I just started reading Dune. You're like the third person who just started reading Dune this week that I heard about. I don't know what it is about that book right now, but... I've had it in my Audible account for like a year nice. and finally starting it. Well, isn't there a new one coming out at some point? I thought and that might be... Yeah, that, that would explain it then. Well, fear mm -hmm. is the mind killer, Scott. We will pass it over to Ryan. Ryan Russell. Got to find that I that mute button. Yeah, there. Yeah. Hey, so Ryan, uh, I work for, for Micron as a data scientist, uh, mainly focused on doing uh, image recognition, deep learning stuff for uh, all the all the manufacturing stuff that we do. So we see a lot of a lot of image data just of our wafers as they're processing. So a lot of deep learning to do to kind of real time interdiction for quality issues. Um, Last book I read was Indistractable uh, by Nir Al. Is that how you say his name? He's got a kind of a funny name. Anyway, good, good book. It's a good one. So, what's it about? It's just kind of about uh, how you can kind of still develop. 
these habits of not becoming sucked into social media to uh, be able to focus and get the things done you want to do uh, as opposed to, I don't know, be hanging out on Slack or, or whatever. So probably <laughs> near it all was also the same guy who wrote a book called Hooked, which he was did. Like products. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He actually starts the book out with that. It's like, yeah. So I pretty much wrote the book on how to get everyone hooked on social media. So now here's the book on how you can avoid it. So very nice. <laughs> It's right the right the problem and make the antidote right i guess so anyway all right uh let's see it looks like mark keeling you also raised your hand that you're new would you care to introduce yourself yeah uh so my name is mark keeling i'm a data engineer for optum 360 which is just a uh, child company of united healthcare and uh, mainly i work in click but i am writing python introducing it into our shop um i'm the only one in my on my team that writes Python. Currently, I'm just using it to test our data pipeline. And the last book I read was The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor's last name. So it's a good book. I recommend it. Awesome. Uh, Stuart Jansen, you also raised your hand. If you would care to introduce yourself. Including the unmute button, a very complicated step. Uh, so I work down in uh, South Jordan for Hireview. Uh, we are primarily a Python shop, although I'm trying to uh, introduce some Go there. Uh, and book that I most recently read, uh, recently started Prague Prague's Elixir book. Nice, going to the dark side. Um, awesome. Let's see, did anybody else want to introduce themselves? Or anybody else who's new? All right. Yeah, uh, last book I read, the one I'm currently reading, by the way, is this guy, which has a hilarious, hilarious cover, but it's bioinformatics algorithms. And yes, that is a Tyrannosaurus chicken chasing a monkey typing on a typewriter in the back of a Jeep. It's amazing. I will link it in the uh, Slack. Uh, what's really cool about this book is that uh, the first seven chapters are online. Um, and if you do take the class, the first class is free. Uh, if you're interested in any bioinformatics, the first class, uh, the first chapter, I guess, would be free and they base it on Python. The other cool thing is chapter seven is how to use Python to track SARS. Not the current one, the previous one, but it's still really interesting that they teach you how to do that with genetics. Um, so if you're, if you're looking to, to do some not so light reading about uh, biology, um, I'm currently at a genetics company, which is why I'm trying to like get my chops back on with this stuff. But just it, this one I stumbled upon this book and I can't put it down. It's one of the few technical manuals I have not been able to put down. Um, I'll, I'll link to it in our etherpad. Uh, let's see, what else do we got? Oh, right, so we have a section that we always do um, where we try to find out who's hiring, specifically in the Valley, but of course remote job, everything's remote right now, so remote jobs are appreciated. So if you know of anybody who's hiring, uh, feel, please raise your hand on the participant and we'll get to you. Raising your hand again is done by clicking on the participants at the bottom, and then it should show the raise your hand button. You can also use this emoji reaction and I should catch it. The, the raising the hand might be nicer. Cause, yeah, because then I could lower it. <laughs> yeah. If anybody knows of anybody who's hiring. Uh-oh. Everything's on a hiring freeze right now. Is that is that the impression I should be getting right now? I mean, that's what your company is, right, Ferris? Yep. And recursion is, I see Isla nodding, nodding more vigorously now. Higher view is not hiring. Well, <laughs> I went ahead and I did some background research to make sure that this didn't happen. So I, I didn't, I don't have it ready to paste, but I will say, this is kind of an aside, PyCon US is happening right now. Can everybody see this on the screen? Um, 
this is all online. And uh, where is it? Ah, somewhere on this page, and I can't find it right now. There, there was a, they're doing an online job fair and I can't find it. Yeah, let me Google it. Online job fair, PyCon 2020. There we go. So I'll just paste this. So these are job listings. So if anybody, anybody play Pokemon when you were a kid, now's your chance to work for the Pokemon company international. Just saying they are hiring. So if you've ever wanted to do something like that. Um, are you sharing your screen? Cause I'm not seeing. Am I not sharing it? I thought I was. Okay. I thought I was sharing my screen. My bad. Here we go. Yeah, so the Python jobs fair is all online this year. Usually this is an in-person event, so this is kind of a boon for people. Um, you can browse through here, but here are some job listings, and these are all, of course, remote right now. Um, Corning, for example, the people who make the you know beakers and test tubes and whatnot, Progressive, Noveta, and then, yeah, these are all pasted right here. All right. And then the next part that we usually do is who's looking. So if you are currently looking, feel free to raise your hand and we will introduce you to the group here. If you're looking for work, hit the raise hand on the thing. Now's your chance. No, nobody is looking. Oh, here we go, John Sherrill. You want to tell us about yourself a little bit? Hey, what's up? Um, just moved to Salt Lake last summer. Uh, I came here, I was a musician, and now that's not happening anymore. So kind of returning to some, I guess, data science roots that I had in the past. Um, been doing a little stuff with Python past month or so, getting back in the swing of things. Awesome. So John Sherrill, musician, hacker, data science nerd. <laughs> um, feel free to update this with your contact details. Cool. And anybody else who is looking, feel free to raise your hand on the participants view. Going once. I'm, I'm oh. gonna go. I'm oh, raising my Dylan's hand. going. Okay, good. Right. So hi, I'm Dylan Gregerson, uh, data scientist, uh, data engineer, um, yeah, looking, looking to work on sort of sciencey side and research things in data science. I think those are, uh, fun problems to work on. Um, but I've sort of worked the full stack. So yeah, nobody's hiring, but I'm looking. Well, I just disproved that nobody's hiring. People are hiring but it's trickier. It's definitely much harder. And uh, yeah, if anybody else wants to raise your hand. Going once, going twice. All right, and I will re-extend my offer. If anybody ever feels like you need some coaching on uh, the interview process or you're looking for work and you just don't feel like, you know, mentioning this in a public forum, feel free to reach out via Meetup. Just send me a message. I'll connect with you, we'll figure something out. The community's here for you, so. Um, sweet, let's talk community news. Uh, Dylan, do you wanna talk about the Utah Python Zoom for meetups? Yeah, so Utah Python, did we talk about Utah Python yet? I don't think we gave we the We kind of touched intro. on it, but, but you yeah. could reintroduce us. All right, I'll reintroduce us. So um, it's a nonprofit, so we have nonprofit status with the state of Utah. Our main goal is to empower other meetups and technology um, throughout Utah. Uh, one of the ways that we just started doing this is we bought a Zoom account and want to make it available for any meetups that might want to use Zoom to host their meetups and have you know, up to 100 participants and not be limited to 40 minutes. So I created a, a Google form 
that if you want to access our shared Zoom account, because we're doing the whole like, instead of buying a ton of accounts, there's just gonna be one we share and be responsible citizens for. And so if you go into this form, you can fill that out and then we can hook up and get you access to a free Zoom account. Thanks for putting that together, Dylan. Um, yeah, so if people need this, it is a resource. Python 2020 is canceled, kinda. It is online to continue with our community news. Um, as I mentioned in LinkedIn here, if you just go to PyCon 2020, it's pretty much at the top of the page. Uh, here it is. So here's PyCon 2020 online. And I think the idea is they're going to be extending the time frame. So usually it's a three-day conference, but now it'll be two or three weeks with some releases of keynotes throughout that process. Um, definitely keep checking back on this page. Um, people can see my screen, I think. Yeah. So. Um, and yeah, there's all kinds of new talks. Um, I haven't had a chance to watch any of the new ones yet, but I was, this effective data visualization was a, uh, uh, workshop I was planning. I had paid for that now I get to watch for free, I guess, but, um, yeah, this is also one that I had, it's officially legal. So let's scrape the web, which is, yeah, I really like the description of that one. Um, what else do we got? Oh, Python 3.9, I think, are they still in beta or are we officially in a uh, release candidate? Let's see. Oh, it might be an alpha. I think it's an alpha now. Uh, it would but be it's, not, it's not a full release. Let's see. Oh, sorry. Alpha beta, yeah. Oh, yeah, alpha 2. Yeah. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Eh, well, I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think we're in alpha, so. Pretty sure. Right. I played around with it, not a ton of new features. Um, not like a huge reason that everybody should jump to 3.9 right now, but uh, definitely news. Um, I think PyCharm got updated. I'm not sure if that's news. That's worthy of this. Uh, what else? There was something else. I'm trying to remember. Hold on, I'm going to check my email real quick. So I'm going to pause the share. I had a newsletter and I was like, oh, wait, I need to mention this at the group. It's like starred. Okay, I can't find it, but that's okay. I will paste some links over here. Um, so yeah, it's 3.9 alpha 6 just came out. Uh, the other place I forgot to mention is there is a Python job board right here for remote jobs. Um, one thing that I just saw that Dylan might be interested in, um, Real Python is a great site and they're looking for uh, tutorial authors. And if you've ever read a Real Python tutorial, um, they're very robust. Uh, they, they will start with like a bunch of examples and they'll get into, you know, why you would use something and then they'll get deep into internals. It, they're really well written. So highly recommend those and I'll paste that here. And yeah, all right, cool. With that, I think we'll just jump right into our introductory Python talks before. So we like to do just a mini talk about, you know, getting into Python for people who maybe not are not as experienced with Python um, and want to try it out. Um, and then I like I the, can we do a, can we do a raise of hands real quick and see who is like, who would describe themselves as new to Python? Raise your hands again is clicking on the participant list at the bottom. Over on the right, there's like a little raise hand feature. Cool. 
Oh. Looks like we got one response. So at least one of you. Way to go, Kevin. You're doing yes. awesome. We we really dig it. Oh, hey, Ben. I was just thinking about you because I was going to do test-driven development. And Matt Harrison, who just jumped on, wrote a book about using PyCharm. Let me see if I can find it back here. Dink, dink. He, here it is. He, he could debug your issue. Chris, yeah, so Matt, I'm just getting my PyTest config up and running. But yeah, for people who don't know, Matt wrote this book over here, Effective PyCharm. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have a celebrity in our Zoom, guys. Just saying, just saying. You're you're in the right Zoom. Matt's uh, like, I'm no celebrity. But yeah, so that's a book written by one of our members. And today, kind of uh, like you're going to get 0.1% of that book. And what we're going to do is we're going to debug or we're going to do test-driven development for humans. So... I, uh, I've lately become of the view that everything should just be test-driven, like development. Um, don't actually don't say everything. that too loud. What does that mean, Ferris? Oh, what does that mean? Well, to answer that question, first I'm going to make sure that people can see the screen okay. Can everybody read this code okay? It's a super simple function. All right. Can you zoom in a little bit? That's a little small for me. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, appearance. Hey, hey, Matt, what's the keyboard shortcut for it? <laughs> Can I ask the author of the Py, PyCharm book if, like, is that a thing or should I just know? Let's see. Presentation mode. Ooh, fancy. Although I don't want that. I decided I don't want that. Exit presentation mode. How do I make the font bigger? This should be straightforward. I rarely use, I guess I don't use PyCharm as much as I thought I did. You need to go into settings and tweak it from the settings. Oh, that's so annoying. I can hit Control Shift A and just say font size and increase, right? I could just do this. The... I can see it just fine and I'm using my phone. Uh, it's much better. Yes, bigger. Okay, there we are. So basically, I want to write a function that takes, let's, let's document it. So param a is a, any number type. And basically, this is a parameter. And we have this function, which we start with def. And all the function is, is just, I want to take some Python code and repeat it. So for example, you could run this as int addition one, two, and we would assume this is three, right? And then num would be three. Because all it's doing is taking these parameters, these variables, a and b, and returning ret, which is a variable that we made here, but we could just return a. Um, Basically, what I want to do, though, is I want to write the most complicated integer addition ever. Uh, and what are some parameters? What are some ways we want to squeeze it? So what are some rules we want to add here? Uh, if it's a flow, what do we want to do? Let's round up. If it's a non-number. What do we want to do? Just throw an exception. So we got this really basic function started. And what we'll do is we'll write a test for it. And now I get to make this bigger too. Can we read this OK? So a test is just other Python, and all the Python that this Python is doing is testing our first Python. Is this confusing enough? No? All right. And what we're going to do is we'll write a test called test int addition, which tests our integer addition. 
And what's really cool about PyTest, which is what we're going to be using to write our test today, is it has this really helpful thing called a decorator. So a decorator is like a function with another function as a hat, which is to say this is a function that has a function as an argument, which is to say just ignore what I just said and just put this on the top of your function and it'll do things to your function. Um, in this case, what we're going to be doing is parameterization. Um, and what that will do is instead of having to write a bunch of tests that test different parameters, we're just going to write all the cases that we want. So here's a few initial ones. And how it works is your first line here is going to be a comma delimited string that says, okay, I have A, B, and expected. And these are going to end up being variables that you pass into this test. So A, B, and we're going to expect three. So let's write one more case. So that's going to be 1.5, let's say 1, or let's say 2 point, I don't know, let's do 8. So we, you know, we can do this addition in our heads, and that is 4.3. But we don't expect 4.3, we should expect 4. Right? And let's write one that'll break it. So 1. 1.9, and we want this to be 3. So right now, there's a bug in the code. And the bug is, even though we're passing in floats over here, we're expecting to get ints on the other side. A float is any number you know that is between the integers. That's how you can think about them. Um, and integers are you know the big numbers that are not partial. They're not fractions. They're not decimals. Again, this is just an intro to Python talk. We can talk about uh, other uh, types later. But I should be able to run this and debug. And there we go. So we have three failed tests after I hit this debug button. Um, the first one, oh, and it'll tell you what failed on each. So as you can see, our first failure is 3 is not equal to 3.3. .3. So it was expecting to get 3, but really what it got was 3.3, .3 because our expected and actual was up here. Expected. Oops, I got that mixed up. It should be actual and expected, right? And what's nice about PyCharm is it'll show you these differences. This doesn't seem like it's that important, but when you're working with, say, data frames, um, it's super helpful. So this one's failed. This one's failed. Look at all these failures. Isn't that just lovely? So how would we go about fixing this? Dylan, do you mind pair programming a little bit with me? Okie dokie. All right. Uh, so. You know, we want to return an int, so maybe the first thing we should do is just make this an integer. What do you think? Sounds good. All right. And what's going to happen when I run this? All right. And it looks like we have one test now that's failing. So yep. it says right here, it's kind of small. Test failed one, pass three of four. You're doing great, Chris. <laughs> This is like 90% of pair programming people is just cheering on the Starsky. By the way, they're called Starsky because Starsky was the one who was always driving the car. So um, I believe our issue right here, right, is we're getting two, but we're expecting three. Now, one plus 1.9 should be 2.9. And if we rounded that up, we would expect three. However, what's going on here? So let's say you're debugging this. You have a couple options. Um, I'm going to put a breakpoint right here just for fun, and we're going to re-debug this. And this breakpoint, this will basically stop everything and show us what variables we got. So we have an int1, int2, and we have an expected int3. And where's the button? I'm used to this on a Mac. 
although everything should be showing the same thing. So I'm not allowed to use that excuse. As an aside, apparently 30% of people don't use a debugger. And if you're part of that 30%, you should use a debugger. It will save you. It is amazing. Um, but yeah, what we can do is during this, this loop, we'll see, you know, 1.12 expected, resume, expected four. And then this last frame, because remember, this whole thing's being repeated for each one of these parameters, is one, 1 1.9, expected three. And what we can do, instead of just running the next one, we can hit this uh, step into next part of my code. So this will just take the next step and run it. And so now we're at ret equals a, b. And as you can see, a is one and b is uh, 1.9. And so we could say, I think this will work, a plus b, evaluate. And so we, what we just did is we, we took our frozen code, basically we stopped in place and we can evaluate any expression we want. So we could even do int a plus b, right? If we just wanted to kind of get a sense of what should be returned right here. So in more complicated code, this definitely matters. I think this will work right. So Right. So what we did is I used a different uh, function called round. And round, let me see. So if I double click on round, oh no. And that's just great. Okay, I have a PyCharm error here, but typically what should happen is you would see documentation about round and what it would return. And in this case, in case you don't have PyCharm, you could do help round. And it will tell you in the console, you know, we're rounding a number to a given precision in decimal digits. Return if a digit is emitted or none. Otherwise, return has the same type. And digits may be negative. So let's try our test again. And what do we expect to happen? I think it's all gonna work great. I think it's gonna work on your machine. And it does work on my machine, which is the Yay. common joke. Um, let's break it one more time. And we should expect, and this is, this is the exercise for the reader and I, I'll paste the solution to this because I have it on a different machine. How do you do an expected raise condition here? In PyCharm? Um, yeah. But instead what I'll do is I'll make an expected uh, zero uh, and we'll do that real here. So this one didn't have zero. Instead we had a type error. So what we can do here is a exception handler where we'll say, try and return. And what was it, a type error, return zero. So let's just say, if it's a type error, this is terrible coding, don't really do this, but return zero. And there we go. Our last test has passed right here. So that's pretty much how you think of test-driven development. Now, some trickier stuff um, when you're trying to do this on a production environment or in an established code base, building these parameters can be tricky because you have to think through not just the happy cases, but also you know, the bad case. So like what, what do we expect when we have bad data in coming. The other thing is uh, fixtures. So for example, let's say you have to set up a database table in your test. That can get a little bit tricky, but as just an intro, you know, this is how you could approach test-driven development. Write your test first, write what you think should be expected from that function that you're testing, and assert it, and keep breaking it until it works. 
And that's what I got for that. Any questions with that? Feel free to raise your hand in that participants button. Hey, Ferris. Um, I was curious, uh, there are times where you do want to test that you do raise the right conditions. Um, and yeah, what, what's the, what's the standard approach you take to doing that? So you might have a bunch of test cases that result in the way you, you want the code to work, but you also have a bunch of test cases where you're expecting certain things to be raised. Uh, other than doing the try, try accept uh, where you return like a value. Uh, to be clear, are you saying to test that we're raising the correct exception or are you, are you asking about uh, other approaches to raising uh, in here in the actual function? Um, different uh, other ways to test the exceptions being raised. So the exercise to the reader is now happening now apparently. Um, I ran into this uh, uh, two weeks ago, and that's why I'm kind of bringing it up. Um, one thing to note, this mark parameterize, it might not be the best approach because what you'll have to do is add context management right here. Matt might have, he's very pensive looking with his hands behind his head, but he um, might have a better idea to do this. I, I mean, I would just write a separate test case. I would write yeah. a test case for passing tests, and then I would write a test case for failures. Right. And in PyTest, there's uh, the PyTest raises a context manager. Mm -hmm. So you just use the with statement with the PyTest raises and inside of the context block, you would run your code and presumably it would throw the exception. So yeah, that's, that's, that's how I've done, done it in the past where you have like a one block for things that you expect to pass and then one block for things that you expect to raise. Yep, and that's exactly what I was going to say. Is that's that's what uh, yeah, that's that's the approach that I've taken to is I have a happy path and a not so happy path, and I try to parameterize both. Um, let's see. I think this one will fail, right? Let's see, because it should return zero. Yeah, so we expect this one to fail, but if this one fails, the other one won't. So just. There, save, and we will comment this out. No, this, okay. And now everything passes. So for people following along at home, this is pytest.raises, um, and this is called a context manager. So basically, when you use the with key keyword in Python, everything underneath that block uh, now has that context. So in this context, for example, uh, I don't know how complicated I want to get, but basically the scope of int addition only applies inside this block. So the type error being raised, there's probably a better way to explain it. Anybody have a better way to explain it? Any takers? How to explain a context manager? So a, con a context has an entry and an, an exit. And so the entry and an exit for the with statement is the indented portion there. And so part of the protocol of the context manager is that the context manager has access to any exceptions that are raised inside of the block. And so because that int addition there is going to raise an exception because it's indented, uh, that exception will be bubbled up to the PyTest raises code, which will be able to inspect the exception and make sure that the exception happened. Exactamundo. So, um, so to give Textbook a little bit, definition there, Matt. Yeah. To give some more background on that, a, a common pattern in Python is to use uh, this context manager with uh, I/O processes. So, so let's say you have some file. What you'll do is you'll say as f or whatever variable, and you know, f dot read. But if you were to try to grab F out here, you would get an exception because you're now outside that scope. The other nice thing that this lets you do is this will ensure that you've closed the reference to that open file now. So that's another common uh, use of that. All right.
let's see. I'm going to check. It looks like we got some in the chat. All right. Yeah, Jess was like, uh, it's just pie test raises. Duh. Uh, let's see. Any hands? Any other questions? All right. If that's the case, I think I'm going to start taking a back seat. And I will leave it to Dylan to start our talk, our discussion about Python in Utah. You want to take it away? Sweet. Thanks, Ferris. All right. So I have a little bit of a presentation, and then um, it's going to be a fairly open discussion style for everybody involved. Uh, this is a bit of an experiment. I've been a part of a couple other groups that have done, instead of having a virtual meeting, essentially be one person talking at everybody. This is more of a round table. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I am very optimistic about it. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Share. Oh, this. <laughs> Just a second. So that when I hit share, it, I think it took it to a different screen. <laughs> All right. All right, state of Python. Next slide. All right. So Python is still a very popular language. Go figure. We have a meetup. People keep attending. It's great. Um, according to several lists, so I've been, I went through for this presentation and kind of looked out at what is currently known, what kind of data we have about Python right now. Uh, Stack Overflow has their list and shows it number four on their top languages, number one on their most wanted languages when you select it. GitHub list actually had Python move up in the rankings and is now just below JavaScript, um, according to GitHub repos. And then this other resource, uh, Toby, which tracks uh, popularity of software languages, uh, has Python ranked three below Java and C. So Python is still one of the most popular languages um, out there today. So this shows Python being tracked over time by Toby. So its highest position, it's basically kept going up. Its lowest position was a very long time ago 2003. So we've had tons of years of Python being, of continuing to grow. And it's amazing to note in this graph, kind of the last two years, this even rampant growth um, continuing to increase. Uh, my speculation is this little trough might be the Python 2 to 3 conversion. Does anybody else want to speculate on that? I don't know the answer to that, but I would like to know what that spike is in mid two thousand four. Yeah, that would be that would be Matt, pretty interesting. Matt, you as well. were around, right? What what happened then? Uh, I mean, I would probably attribute that to like Web two point Django sort of coming out there. Um, I mean, also that's like sort of the start of NumPy land, but I mean I, that. 2004, 2005 is when Django came out and the whole Web 2.0 ajax -y stuff was pretty popular. And so, I don't know, data's fickle. Maybe there was some pandemic going on. We had a black swan event. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so why is Python so popular? Well, it's easy to learn. It's versatile, widely used, and has a large community supporting it. So on the right here is a list from the Python Developers Survey, which we're lucky enough to um, have had come out even just this last week. They do a survey at the end of every year for the last three years, and these are the results. And you can see that Python is used across so many different domains. Uh, artificial intelligence, astronomy, cryptography, um, like research, language processing, music, 
uh, some gaming, trading, like so many different uses for Python. Um, it's really such a ver versatile language. All right, um, Ferris. Ooh, actually, I think I can do it. All right, if you look at your bolt at, at the bar, there is a poll option. Uh, I can launch it. Can you launch it? Ooh, I can launch it. Okay, you gotta hit the button. Yay. Cool. I launched it. All right, everybody. I don't exactly know what your experience is, um, but I think it popped up a poll for you. If you will go ahead and answer this, um, how do you mainly use Python in your job? Oh, and there's multiple choices, I think, allowed. Oh, this is way cool. <laughs> I see, I see 67% voted, 80% voted. We're gonna make this 100%. I think we have, have, we can get to 100%, 90%. Can everybody see the results or is it just me? Just, no, Jess is, Jess is shaking her head. Adam, you see it? We, we can't see your uh, zoom on purpose. They won't let you see that. Yeah, I know, but can you, can you see the results on your own screen? Still no? Still shaking the head. For some reason, <laughs> Jess, yours is the only one, only little video that's showing for me. All right, 95%, one more person. Are we got somebody opting out? Five, Did you four. vote, Dylan? No. <laughs> <laughs> How am I supposed to vote? <laughs> oh, I, I don't know if it's, I don't know how to click. No, I, I don't know how to vote. I don't think I can. Hosts can't vote. Ah. Well, there we go. End poll. Um, it won't let me show the whole screen at once. Let's. Uh, you have to hit share. I just did it. It just popped up on my screen. Ah, everyone can see the sharing results now? Cool. Um, all right. Let's see how we did. So um, in this slide, it, these are the results from the Python developer survey put out by the Python Software Foundation and JetBrains um, showing the main uses for Python. So looks like data analysis at 60%. We match up perfectly. Uh, we're skewing heavier data analysis than web development, but it's still interesting to see. Can, it, can everybody see this, like these comparisons? All right, got Jess nodding her head. Cool. <laughs> um, machine learning, a little high. Systems and dev. DevOps, web scrapers, web testing, educational purposes. Who wants to speak to that one? Oh, I guess that's probably Matt Harris. Matt Harrison, right? You and educational purposes? Either way. Um, so that was fun. Moving on. So I want to open up, that was my little introduction to this. And the next part is going to be introducing some discussion topics. Um, I want to set some ground rules for talking. So this is not a debate. We want all the different points of view. Don't feel like your point of view is wrong. Um, seek first to understand others, not to be understood. Everyone is encouraged to participate. Um, when you speak, like say your name, we also have your name there. Maybe not where you work. This might not be necessary for us. Um, and then also remember to wash your hands frequently for at least 20 seconds. It is a pandemic. All right. One thing I'm not exactly sure. Let me go back. 
but no, I'll leave this up here for just a second. Think about this question. Uh, does popularity for Python match your expectations? Um, being the fourth, third, or second most popular language, um, does it match your experience within Utah? Um, I believe that when I'm screen sharing, everyone can't see everyone else's faces. Everyone's really small. This is correct. Um, is there a way to make a grid view with a screen share? Does anybody know if that's possible? Yeah, so what you do is when you're screen sharing, there's a little button that says gallery view. If you click that button on the, I think it's on the upper right on Macs. I'm not sure on Windows. I'm on Windows right now and I'm trying to figure it out. For everybody else or just for me? This is for individual clients. Uh, individual participants can choose what they want to see. So yeah, if you're on a Mac, the top right, there's a little three by three box uh, above the video that you can click to switch from speaker view to the gallery view. The thing Perfect. that you might also need in view options is side by side mode. The other step that you might need to do is if you see that bar, there's like two lines between the faces on the right and the presentation, you can drag that and then you will see everybody's pretty faces and or profile pictures. Fantastic. All right. So popular for Python within Utah. Anybody uh, want to jump in on a thought? I will. Okay. So you were asking uh, if it fits our expectation for Python in general or for our particular industry or how we use it. How you use it, okay. I think. I mean, the poll locally that we just did in this group was a little lower for DevOps, which is what I use it for mostly, um, versus the poll that you showed of a broader market. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I also attend the DevOps meetup, and there's a lot of folks using Python there as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it makes sense. Our right. group tends to, to skew more web and data oriented. Mm -hmm. So Matt, uh, what, what do other people use who are at the DevOps group besides Python? Um, they might use some vendor tools. So some sort of SaaS offering, but they're not really, and I'm not sure what underlies those platforms. Um, for some cloud providers, JVM languages are also very popular. Personally, I prefer using something like Python though, just because less ceremony in setting up your tools and a lot less boilerplate. It's interesting for web development. Um, I know at my last job, and uh, Stuart, you sort of hinted to this as well, there's quite a few web developers that are like, oh, Go is the new shiny thing. Python, Django, eh, not so much. Uh, do you think popularity is going to go down for Python and web with some newer tools like, like Go? I will say this, as long as people are building applications with an ORM, Django will be more popular than Go. It is really hard to build a good ORM in Go. They, as far as I'm concerned, they don't exist yet and they probably won't for a long time, if ever. It's interesting, why don't you think that they will exist? Because it seems as though you could just take the existing, like, here's how Django did it. I'll just replicate it. I mean, Python's done that over and over again. Go has a slightly different take on things like uh, object-oriented design. Uh, it doesn't have tr traditional style classes. Uh, and because it's type checker is strict enough to make it harder without giving you quite enough additional flexibility to work around some of that strictness. Mm. Uh, also culturally, the Go community 
just doesn't like dependencies. So there's a more of a, a cultural tendency towards liking pure SQL. Is this other people's experience within web? Um, I mean, we don't do web, but we're at enough companies where we talk to most application teams at one point or another. Um, can you hear me okay? Can't tell. Yeah, I got Great. you, Joe. Thanks. Um, yeah, I would say like Python is definitely the exception when it comes to anything that's not data related. And maybe that's just me, but um, everywhere I've been, and it's quite a few places at this point, I would say like C Sharp, Java, um, some Go, depending. I think Go almost has like a religious quality to it that, you, that people are very attached to it and um, love to talk about it a lot. Uh, um, but I would say that the companies where people don't like to talk about their languages or are as uh, religiously inclined, it tends to be the C-sharps and Javas and I think more enterprise-y languages. And I'm surprised at the number of startups actually that I see using um, Java and uh, like .NET as well. It's actually a lot. Um, I think maybe, but you got to understand too, like at, at the types of companies that these are, I mean, they, you know, when, when somebody starts a code base, I mean, they're typically migrating from whatever they know and those languages just happen to be very popular anyway. So you're going to, you're going to build with what you know, not with what's cool. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think in Utah, especially, I mean, if you talk to recruiters, I mean, um, you know, we, we share some recruiter friends. I mean, I, I talked to her and she's, uh, she says definitely like Python jobs are, definitely not as plentiful if you're not talking about data. Um, you know, it tends to be a lot of Java, so. Interesting. Two things I think are worth mentioning is one, if you haven't used Java in the last five years, it's gotten a lot better. So building a web application today uh, is much more enjoyable than it was, you know, five, 10 years ago. Uh, and the other one is nobody's mentioned Node yet, but uh, Node has- <laughs> Oh, Node's the other one. I'm sorry. Too. I knew there was one. Yeah, that's the other big one. Every, yeah, I would say all the startups around here, like everything JavaScript um, is, uh, is front and center. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> I knew there was like this gigantic thing staring in front of me that I couldn't quite remember. It's, uh, it's JavaScript, so. Also, the, Almost. there are friendly JVM languages like Kotlin and Groovy. Um, we use Clojure, believe it or not, at work. So, um, you know, there's lots of friendlier, easier syntax languages that interoperate well with Java. Just that also explains the popularity. Yeah. Well, even in data, it brings up a good point because there's data languages. Like, if you look at any of the Apache frameworks, it's all JVM based. Yes. Um, I mean, without, without exception. So. I had a web question that was somewhat related. Is okay. anybody using something that's not Django or Flask for Python web? Um, I have a question coming up that's going to oh, okay. address I, that. My apologies. Specific, no, no, no. I mean, you couldn't know. So, but we'll make sure uh, we touch on that um, around web frameworks for Python coming up. All right, I'm keeping the, I'm gonna just like keep moving these questions through at about maybe every 10 minutes or so. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the what Python is being used for. I think we kind of started touching on this with like web development has a very mixed bag. Um, also, maybe data analysis has a mixed bag with some of the Apache products um, using uh, Java-based tools. Uh, we saw with the plot that I showed earlier, Java is still like the top language, um, but Python pretty close behind. Um, what is Python being used for? Um, what wouldn't you use it for? What would you be like, ah, no, no, definitely go with something else. Um, here's that list again of all the different uses. If I had to write very low level, code that touches bare metal system resources. I might consider Python to prototype, but I probably wouldn't deploy that code in production. I agree. Would you use C instead or C++? I might consider C and C++. I've definitely programmed a lot of using that in the past. Go would be a reasonable option or Rust. I mean, there's 
a lot of good low-level languages out there that do better memory management than C++, but it would depend on the project, the requirements, how fast you had to get some code up and running. Yeah. How it was going to be any, distributed. Is anybody using Fortran for that speed bare metal as well? Well, if you're using Bloss and LAPAC, <laughs> it, eventually it does come down to Fortran. <laughs> But, I, I know, but no one's going to start writing Fortran. <laughs> maybe tangentially related, is anybody using the non-C Python or maybe Jython or PyPy in projects? Or is uh, is the gut feeling to just go and use Go instead of trying to recompile? I think, I, I think that was it. popular like a few years ago, but anymore I've seen people just either move to Rust or Go for that kind of stuff. I'm curious as to why. I mean, I, it feels like it would be easier to port from Cython to or C Python to uh, to PyPy or something like that. Yeah. So my impression was that Jython was basically a dead project. I am shocked to go to GitHub and discover that it's actually had commits this year. Really? Like like significant or just like a little bit of heartbeat? Uh, there are multiple files that have been touched, uh, although nothing less than two months ago. So, hmm. and they're still only supporting uh, Pyth uh, Python 2.7. They don't have any Python 3 support. Oh, well, I have that question coming up too, but. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think some of those were seemed like a little bit more like experiments for Python, where people are like, "I like Python. We can sort of make it do anything," and yeah, it just doesn't perform as well. Like if you're trying to like get Python running on the JVM, then you might as well just use something that's made to run on the JVM. Well, and I think as Stuart said, like Java ain't half bad these days. Like it's actually tolerable to write in it. Um, so. I've heard the same thing about Fortran, at least from the internet, but I haven't tried it. <laughs> I've actually got a little Fortran experience. It's not that enjoyable. <laughs> yeah? Like recent Fortran, Isla? Um, no, Fortran 77, I think was maybe a I little had, Fortran 90. I had, I had Fortran 77 in, in my astronomy days. That's like kind of the first language that I really hacked on. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Go to nice. statements. Go to statements were the thing. <laughs> you just yeah. like dropped into some part of your code and it said, go to somewhere else in your code. And you're like, where? <laughs> it's just like creative spaghetti code, like nobody's business. So Fortran's coming back. That's really interesting. I think for a few high performance things, um, because of how it, from my understanding, it's because of how it stores its arrays. It's the so, global array thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's like the way it stores its array in memory instead of C. I mm -hmm. think it has a similar effect to columnar versus row-based operations. Yeah, if you want the same thing in C, you have to use libraries like the message passing interface library that a lot of national labs and academic projects use, which is kind of a nightmare. It's very hard to understand and program in. Hmm. Uses for Python. Um, Matt, you mentioned using it for DevOps systems. Um, do you think, and we sort of talked on this a little bit, do you want to maybe rehash it or talk a little bit more in depth about how this is being used in that space? Maybe even talk about frameworks? Like, is this still the go-to for DevOps? Um, I think it is for configuration management. Um, and using something like Ansible or SaltStack? Yeah, SaltStack. Um, but for, uh, there's a lot of uh, SDLs now. Uh, Terraform is a big one for managing infrastructure um, where you're kind of agnostically describing in a more abstract way what you're doing with your resources, not getting so much into code, kind of learning someone else's way of describing things using their own language. 
Does anybody else want to ask what SDL stands for? He meant DSL. Or sorry, DSL. Domain specific language. <laughs> nice. Okay. Who wants to describe what a domain like? Right? If somebody doesn't know, I want them to to right now. Nobody nobody describe it unless somebody says, I don't know what a domain specific language is. Anybody? Anybody want to say I don't know? I want to say that I do know, but do I really know what a domain specific language is? Does anybody? I write SQL. It's, it, it's actually a good point because these days it's about as meaningful as agile. Yeah. You want to say more? Uh, I guess I, I would say that there are two ways to approach it. What I consider to be the more correct definition is domain specific languages are where you actually create a language from scratch uh, that is designed to make the task at hand easier to accomplish. Uh, maybe that's based on audience. So some could, some could claim that uh, Cucumber, uh, if you're familiar with Cucumber style uh, okay. testing, uh, is a domain specific language. The idea is that you write your test cases as English sentences so that you know, like your product managers can read through all of your test cases and, and give a thumbs up, thumbs down to say, yes, this is a valid test or no, that's not valid. Uh, SQL is a great example of a domain specific language where it's specifically designed for uh, declaratively working with sets of data. Uh, you don't necessarily worry about how the code executes. Uh, but a second definition that you'll run into a lot of is basically just a fancy way of saying API, uh, where mm. you, you're designing the names of your functions and your classes and uh, your methods so that somebody looking at the code can be reminded of English. Uh, this is more popular in the Ruby world because Ruby has very flexible syntax. It's more of a space delimited language as in, you know, where Python has uh, the, the parentheses and the colons and more, uh, more decoration basically to, to help with the syntax. Ruby lets you uh, leave a lot of syntax stuff out. So it just looks like word, 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 and then Python and then Ruby figures it out. And so if you're really careful designing your API, it can almost look like a sentence at times. That's cool. I don't use Ruby that much. So like, that's interesting to hear that, that comparison. I think it's actually a language I see a fair bit as well as, um, uh, well, Rails. Uh, but you talk to web devs these days. I mean, there's quite a few people that still swear by Rails, you know, if they're uh, coming from that world. So it's pretty nice. Yeah, I think when I was looking through my research for this, um, Rails was near the top, if not actually the top, like web framework still. I mean, if you want to prototype an app, I, I've, devs I've spoken with, I mean, this is pretty big opinion, but like uh, a lot of them swear that it's the easiest thing to prototype an app in. But, you know. If you've already done the, the learning of all of the Rails framework. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ruby's a cool language. I mean, that's, uh, I, I dorked around with that for a few years way back in the day, but. I guess I uh, decided Python was better because that's what I use a lot, so. Cool. Well, let's move on uh, to another question. All right, so if you didn't know, Python 2.7 is dead. Uh, long live Python 3. Um, these are the statistics. Um, there's still 10% uh, of the people at the end of the last year that have not switched to Python 3. It's probably higher in some domains. Um, one of the things they mentioned was web, which typically has some sort of legacy code coming into it, uh, kind of gets stuck a little bit. I'm not gonna call out who hasn't transitioned yet, but I am gonna ask for those, uh, like what learnings did you have for switching from Python 2 to 3? Uh, what tips, what, like, what really helps you with that transition?
I feel like the, uh, so you sort of in Python 2 and then went through transition to Python 3 at my company. And the thing that made that possible, um, I, I think the big challenge to overcome is dependency management. And I think Docker really made that a, a very possible thing to do. Um, you know, we used to use Ansible to provision all our instances and set them with like, set them at certain versions of Python and it was just impossible to manage because you had to make sure your app was deployed to the right type of instance. Um, that just, I feel like that just got so much easier with Docker. Hmm. How many people are using Docker? Can we do the raise a hand thing? Do we have a little like hand raising tool? Uh, there we go. All right, lower the hands. Can I do that? Ferris, can you do that for me? All right, now not using Docker. Cool, interesting. Any observations? I mean, Docker's not great for every use case, right? Scott, I'm curious, Is uh, did you find that to be a win just because your environment, like it would, let me back up. When you did convert from Python 2 to 3, you're not debugging your environment anymore. It's literally, this should just run as if it was running on uh, the previous state. So there is less to debug. I'm, I'm curious what your motivation to, to use Docker would be and how you would motivate you know, a stakeholder. Um, I think it came more from time management that DevOps spent managing a cluster created through like Ansible. It was kind of, it was a lot of code to manage the systems. Um, and there was, I think there was like more of a company initiative to move to, uh, uh, you know, an auto scaling containerized solution that you're using the resources you need and you can kind of magically scale that out as demand increases. Um, so there's like a cost savings, there's a reduction in time uh, to manage those systems. Um, and I think there's just a lot of, it's just more nimble and agile to develop uh, within, within Docker. So I think for the development teams, it was a big advantage as well. Can you uh, share your slide deck that you gave the executive team for that? Like, no, we can. <laughs> I think that it came down through the uh, DevOps, the, the DevOps uh, pipeline of things. Um, and I think they, they're probably the biggest benefit, uh, they, they benefit the most from that sort of uh, transition. But it's also like, I mean, it's, it takes time and resource to transition. So, yeah. And, and so this helped you a lot with the Python 2 to 3 transition. Um, so as you went through that dependencies, um, like you check your code for compatibility, but then like getting all the dependencies. So you're just like updating one at a time and deploying them to different staging environments. How did that like flow through? Yeah, like um, so this is a couple of years ago. I, I recall like like we had we had a very specific version of Python, and there was a at one point I needed a certain library. And that library needed a higher version of Python 2.7 or something. Um, and it was, I remember it being just such a struggle. So we set up two different types of Python instances, one with like Python 2.7 something installed and one with Python 2.7, the new new version. Um, and you we mean had three? This, or? No, no, like, like different versions of Python 2. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so when you imagine, had this challenge, that sort of motivated you moving into Docker. Is that right? I it I would say it motivated our DevOps team to move towards. Can I guess which package broke everything? Sure, I do not remember, so oh, okay. it may, maybe it will it will remind me. As somebody who's been a backend janitor, I'm betting two seven eleven versus uh, anything before. I think it was two seven nine, and it was cryptography. That was one that was breaking a lot of teams builds. And the only reason I note that is it may or may not have happened at the last job and then the current job that I'm at. So things like that 
it's funny when they happen more than once in different places. I, I had one addition to that, Scott. Did would you say your team had? Uh, I get to interview Scott about his his transition to, to Python three. This is awesome. Um, <laughs> Uh, would you say that your team had kind of a testing culture, like a culture of having a staging environment or somewhere safe to do test deployments in, um, uh, doing integration or QA or functional tests? Uh, we did have a QA team. We did have uh, like a staging environment and a prod environment. Um, so my previous company, we were, it was like a Ruby on Rails app that turned into a much larger uh, microservice architecture. So it started all as one behemoth and then exploded out. And as things started to explode out and new languages were introduced, I think the world of DevOps got really challenging. Uh, and so there was a large push to like, how do we, how do, we do this at, uh, at scale and support all the different needs of all the different engineering teams? Can I ask a question? Can well, I poll sure, people? Yes. I'm, I'm curious, is there anyone here who just has never used Python 2 that like got started at a time when they just jumped on Python 3 right away? Like I was really close to that cusp. Like I was at a level in my Python where I just needed to change my print statements. And that was like, you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my first real experiences uh, with Python were Python 3. Same for me. I. I, they were both being used, but I chose to go with the newer one. And you didn't have to inherit uh, any Python 2. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. All the Python 2 people I was lucky like enough. Envious. Yep. Um, I, I, I do think Docker actually allows Python 2 to still exist. Like, we still have a lot of Python 2 services. And mm -hmm. when you think about replicating, the, I, there are certain libraries that have not been updated to Python 3. And we get really scared to touch that code. And so we don't. And Docker runs it. And Docker solves that problem for us. So I, I think that also has a negative aspect that it, it allows you to, to keep around really legacy code. That's true. Um, any of our contracting friends out there, have you been helping with transitions to Python 2 to 3? Do you still see lots of people on Python 2 at this point? Joe's shaking his head. Uh, what do, you, do you see anything different, Matt Harrison? Matt left. Oh, he did? Before well, left. Yep. and there was only one Matt. Um, yeah, I, I, I haven't seen, no. Google's the only one I've really seen that still is on 2.7, so. <laughs> well, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, they can do what they want, so. Well, uh, the Apache Beam slash, uh, what is it, Dataproc or PubSub? Uh, da uh, Dataflow. Dataflow has finally decided to deprecate 2.7. Yeah, I was about to help them rewrite the Beam into 3 because it was just so painful knowing that it wasn't there. But then I looked at their code and uh, it's like, I have a lot of other things to do. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> rather than uh, kind of dig you out of this mess you should have been working on a while ago. So, yeah, yeah, anyway. But it's there now. It's in three, so it's water under the bridge. So, <laughs> But, I mean, we're already at 3.9 coming up. That's crazy. Yeah. So. Yep. And it looks like uh, from this chart on the right that Python 3.7 is really where people are, like, landing currently i'm not i'm not sure if that's uh just like the most stable or if it hit a timing thing or or what but uh, maybe three seven will be the new two seven who knows yeah maybe that's why they everyone's just so attached to that dot seven yeah uh, just can't get past that so. <laughs> just can't get past it i can i can i can go to three but i can't go to three eight <laughs> Yeah, I think it's something to do with the defaults, like on the old LTS version of Ubuntu and what you install with Brew on Mac. Mm. 
yeah, I'm sure those have big, big effects. All right, moving on. Um, hey, Ferris. Python for the web. Web frameworks. All right, so according to the Python uh, uh, developer survey, there's too many Zoom windows. All right. So Flask beats out Django. And both of those just dominate most other things. Um, tornado, Bottle, Cherry Pie, uh, Falcon. I learned of a new one the other day called Starlet, which was pretty cool. Um, but like, for people who are writing web frameworks, what's your, what's your go-to? What, what would you start in? Would you try something new? And we could maybe even talk a little bit more again about like jumping other languages. I mean, I, I don't know, my, my, oh. I'm teaching myself uh, modern JavaScript right now as a hobby of all things. Um, I figure, you know, I have app ideas and, uh, you know, it's been a while since I've done anything in apps. I mean, I'm like a dated nerd, so, but I, I figure um, everything these days is in JavaScript. So whether you like it or not, it's the world you're in, so. Yeah, I, I had that impression too. Um, and I tried building out or did build out a little website using JavaScript. My impression, my experience with it was that it's really cool. It's really powerful. There's lots of options out there and all of those options are going to bite you in the ass. You basically spend so much time thinking about like, there's 10 different frameworks and all of them have their pros and cons. And now you have to figure out the ORM and this plugin and this plugin and that plugin. And I want to plug in for this. And like, it's great if you kind of know the environment, you can find all the best tools that work together, but everything just starts to feel well, so, so custom. On that end, I've come back to the realization, like I think Stuart hit on this really well too. I mean, if you want an ORM, Django's unbeatable. It's like, after all these years, it's still the best thing out there. If you want to, uh, if you want to roll your own backend, I mean, now you have the option of using like API gateways and just completely bypassing everything. You know, and I think yeah. that's a pretty viable option for a lot of people, honestly. Yeah. Um, but then you, that doesn't mean you get a free lunch. Now you just get to deal with all that headache um, with lambdas and all that stuff behind the scenes. So, but um, but yeah, I mean, you, you know, there's a lot of options. But I'd say if you want to roll your own framework, Django's as good as any any place to get started. It's great. Yeah, I've, I've been playing around my, like my own personal experience, playing around with a couple of different choices, trying out the JavaScript land, the Go land a little bit, um, Flask, like Django just, it's opinionated and those opinions are very useful <laughs> for just building out a thing. And of course, part of it's for me that I know Django at this point, but um, that's, that's where I'm at. Has anybody tried to... Uh... Real-time web, that's something I'm kind of curious about, is uh, the whole PubSub model that definitely is proliferated through mobile phones, um, but also through just chat and things like that. Um, doesn't really, it doesn't flow too well with Django unless you're using Django channels. So I'm curious if people are using things like Tornado or... Well, I'd be curious who's using ASGI or ASGI um, in Django as well. Hmm. That's a first-class citizen now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's everything at Starlet um, and uh, the other projects we're, we're uh, doing, but they just, uh, I think, decided to make async a uh, first class citizen in Django um, a few releases ago. So but I'm curious who's using it. Like, it, uh, Is anybody users... doing any kind of like async or real time Python, something that's not like stateful? Um, we, so. Uh, I'm starting to make the transition from using Flask to Fast API. Fast API is based on Starlet. Um, the reason uh, the reason is we'll we'll make we have all of our like microservices behind like a, a pass through service, uh, and that pass through service okay, if it's yeah exactly. And so that that service if it's async we can do simultaneous requests together. Uh, and it's just so much faster. Um, so that's like the, we're seeing like pretty good benefit from doing that. Um, also fast API has so many amazing best practices built in that um, I don't see, I don't know, I don't see many advantages to still developing in Flask uh, when I can use 
when I can use this newer service with more features built, built in. But I think one of the things that's hidden in, in the, these numbers here uh, is the fact that uh, Flask is really heavily used for, um, uh, I wouldn't say heavily used, but it's used a lot in machine learning projects. Yes, definitely. Uh, one big difference I'll know uh, just in my career in, in Python web and just general web development, um, the concept of open APIs or API specs is definitely becoming more of a thing. Um, I just Google fast API and I noticed that's the first feature they're listing is come up with your spec first and we'll do the rest. I'm curious how well that hooks into like databases. Like what's your experience with that? Like, like mapping that onto your schema that already exists. I don't know about mapping on databases, but the, the documentation for your ser services, your service is like fully automated. Uh, it uses like pedantic for data validation and documentation is purely built off of that. So you don't even have to write documentation. It's amazing. Uh, but I don't know about the schema validation. I've seen the, the database library becoming more popular for that. Um, uh, one, know. I'll drop a link. If people are trying to write uh, uh, Swagger Docs or Open API is now the technical term for it. Um, uh, there's a new tool. It is, in my humble opinion, better than Postman, but I'll drop it in Slack. Um, yeah. But it basically, it'll let you sketch out and design APIs and then uh, debug and test them in the same tool. So I'll just drop that. Yeah, and I think it'll be interesting to see how this evolves, um, especially with with other languages. Because like we PHP sort of came into the world with web and was sort of the go to for a long time because it made lots of things a lot easier. And they were figuring things out still the same. So there's a lot of cruft and like, like new tools came along like Django that learned from all those things and built better. On options of them. And I think we're probably going to see another evolution of that. I think uh, Starlet and some of the async um, is really driving that. I think it's um, the fact that Django didn't or Python didn't have a good async web library during the rise of Node and Go, I think, really yeah. like, like kind of kneecapped um, Python's progression in the web community. Because um, for the longest time, I was like, well, what's, recall, what's, what's fine? You know, what, what's okay? Why is the request response model bad? You can do that just fine. And I, and I think it was sort of a stubbornness that um, ultimately cost, uh, you know, um, some, some mind share because people are just like, well, okay, like the world's going this way. You're over here, like have fun. I mean, it's sort of like hair metal bands that continue playing hair metal 20 years later. <laughs> so but I guess you'll, you'll be popular at some point down the road. So I'm curious. I, I think that's a really good point. Um, but they were integrated into Python like 3.4 and Python 3.5. And I'm curious like how much of it was the fact that people were still on Python 2 for so long before Probably. they could actually get up to Python 3 and actually That's start taking advantage. That's a good point too. Cause I remember the arguments back in the, the three, uh, basically the, uh, the three, five and before days was, um, well, yeah, but like we're, you know, Python 2 is great. Well, we'll that's all we need right now. I mean, it's kind of this argument that it's all we need, right? I think that's, that's just a kind of default argument versus like, well, like, let's get to where the puck's going. And that's, that, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The two to three transition was an absolute disaster, in my opinion. Because um, mm -hmm. I think that it caused a lot of people who were thinking about adopting Python to reconsider and go for something else that didn't have uh, this looming, you know, supposed like deadline, like this Y2K thing. So, yeah. Though that, that previous plot showing adoption, that might have shifted in just the last two years once everyone's like, okay, cool, Python 3 is the way to go and like see that grow. Hmm. But yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see for web whether Python keeps it up. Um, I think, it, I mean, it'll still be a contender and I think it'll still be widely used. Maybe, maybe somebody disagrees, but. Um, 
we might see go just take over. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I think like the, the, the days of like Python having a future in, in web dev, honestly, is kind of, I think that ship sailed. I think the, the real traction where the Python community should focus is on data. That's where it's strong and that's where it has the mind share. So, but that's me and I'm stubborn as well, so. All right, well, on that note, Python for data. Well, I use Python for data all the time. Um, this, uh, this little list is a little bit funny because NumPy, in my opinion, should probably just be part of the core, like Python core, because Python's really just missing a true array class. And NumPy just essentially came in and said, here is a really good array class for you. <laughs> and everybody said, great, we're going to build on top of it. So like all of the, everything below pretty much just uses NumPy. So it's not quite a fair like top tool. Um, but this also gets into our uh, machine learning like areas, right? So you go down the list, um, scikit-learn, uh, TensorFlow, and then Keras, uh, PyTorch really coming in. And uh, what, what are people seeing? Python's still the like, go-to for data, right? Is it taking over from R, from Scala? Yes. I, I don't know. You, you, R for, for exploratory data analysis is still my my favorite, unless I'm playing a lot with REST APIs and pulling data there. Hmm. But as soon as I want to actually do productionize anything, it's it's Python. Productionizing R is not a battle I want to try and die on. <laughs> <laughs> I know I love doing uh, pandas. And it's kind of like my Excel that I used to use. I use Pandas instead. It's such yeah, a good Swiss Army knife. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say Pandas is like the one thing that like I, I think I it probably import in like every single like notebook or session I ever use. Um, I'm interested, Adam. Uh, so I, I, I only have like a tiny bit of experience with R. Like, it, and it sounds like it's worth it to you to actually switch between languages for like some benefits of, of explore, I, I, I spent, I, I spent most of my stats degree working in R. And so I, all, all the tools are just a little bit more natural to me there. Um, I also like the syntax. P Pandas is a little bit more, it's very class-based. Um, and the syntax for, with, with the tidyverse is just, a lot cleaner. Actually, I do have to agree um, with Adam on this one. Yeah. My problem, but, and coming from just solidly using matplotlib for so long, um, is the plot uh, that I want to make when I try to use R because of the way R wants you to build your data frame, to essentially the same way that all of the modern BI tools, you build a table and then you do your pivots into your plot. But like uh -huh. matplotlib, I'm like, oh, throw all these lines everywhere and add a graphic here. And I'm like way more haphazard you, and building my plots. Have you tried ggplot? Yeah, and, and that's my experience with ggplot is essentially like every time I want to add a line, I have to create some sort of table, tidy table, and build out essentially sort of this model. Uh -huh. And I'm like, but I just want to put x and y on this plot. <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a function to do that. It's it's uh, an A B line. Okay. Or it's a. Um, we we we'll have a side chat. Yeah, I mean, it definitely could uh, just be my uh, like I was I, doing a project and I got enough frustrated. I'm like, I'm just gonna use Matplotlib. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I go the other way around. I I I haven't figured out Matplotlib enough, and I figured out ggplot. The, but I'm like, I I can't figure this out. The, the, yeah, I don't blame you. Map all lives a pain in the ass, too. <laughs> yeah. But I would say, like, predominantly, like, Python is the language even, uh, well, I think it depends. Uh, like, analysts, um, I think view R as, like, a hand calculator almost. Like, it's super easy to use. I mean, I do agree with that yes. in this regard. Like, I love R because I can spin up R Studio and just get going. I don't need to import much of anything. If you just want to do most of what you need to do in stats, it's super easy. Um, mm -hmm. 
and it just go it just works like it works beautifully too um but i think the problem is like that was also pointing out are you trying to do anything production like god help you he won't help you actually <laughs> yeah you're, definitely you're on your own I, I think your, your point of a, a hand calculator really is is the uh it's an interactive tool mm -hmm. um it was originally built to, to string together four transcripts <laughs> Um, was the oh, actual <laughs> original wow. uh, original point was that it was a it was a glue language in between Fortran code. Probably that probably that uh, Fortran seventy seven. Am I right, Alan? <laughs> oh, that's, that was probably way too new. That was way too new. It was, it, <laughs> that Fortran uh, sixty. <laughs> Fortran so, something like that. Oh, what is earlier than seventy seven? Yeah, I don't know. Seventy seven was around for so long. Yeah. But it's interesting on, on like LinkedIn and looking at some of the conversations on there because I, I follow quite a few um, uh, data thought leaders and stuff. And, and it's interesting, the conversations. So a lot of people still talk about R, but I, I sense like a lot of people are it, it, the, watching the R versus Python debate is kind of weird to me because um, I'm just like, why don't you just do both? But that's asking a lot of people, I think. So, but it, it's interesting because I, I, I think a lot of R users want to try Python. So, expect yeah. To well, and yeah, so I, I think the biggest thing mm -hmm. Go ahead, is, is just try, trying to get the math. Okay, we don't want to have to re implement all the math because getting a programmer to understand enough statistics to not muck it up when they translate it. Um, and so, you understanding how to, how to get that to trade is. How to be able to work with their language as they've as they've implemented it, so that you can stick and basically push all the math problems back on them and saying, "Hey, your math is bad. Go fix mm -hmm. the math. It's not it's not the DevOps part. It's it's that math." You remember I'm seeing this? this somebody had this out. auto ML, um, this, like auto ML uh, program written in R, um, and we had to try and transcribe it into Python because it was it just wouldn't stay on production. <laughs> They're like, why doesn't this thing work? And it's like, well, hell yeah. Like, it, it, it's, so. it's, it's our. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, yeah. So. I am not convinced I need to use R. No, I, I, I don't think so. But I, we I, haven't done I, a good job of convincing you, but <laughs> you want any. Anyway, that was, your, so that was the goal. <laughs> that was the goal of this whole thing. Did nobody say that? Yeah. Actually, Adam and I planned this the whole time, so it didn't work. <laughs> um, yeah. I think one of the biggest things I've seen change in the last couple of years is more of a reliance on the deep learning frameworks like PyTorch and, and uh, TensorFlow. And I think like, like my background is in recommendation systems. And like when I wanted to use a different cost function in a recommendation library, it meant I had to switch to a different library. And so I, in my head, I maintained like five different recommendation libraries. I would use different ones for different types of things. And I feel like PyTorch and TensorFlow came along and it just made it all, all of a sudden to change a cost function. I could create my own in that framework. And I had so much more flexibility while only having to really understand one big framework or library. And I found that to be extremely advantageous. Um, Yeah, it really does seem that the the machine learning libraries, those those two especially, like drive a lot of like is I, I haven't actually tried any of like tried that in R. My R has been some plotting and playing around with functions and variables, but No, it's definitely more of a statistician's playground. If I was trying to do any sort of machine learning Python with with the uh with those libraries with, with with something that that's pre-built and but I mean, is definitely gonna be the way to go. We saw this when we started SLC Python. I mean, the first year it, when we were about to call this the SLC Web Dev Group or whatever it was, Python Web yeah. Dev. It wasn't even gonna be SLC Python. It was because we, we figured, oh well, the universe obviously revolves around Django developers. Um, uh, but, to to be clear, it was because I thought the Python community was large enough that we needed a subsection of sure. just web developers. But what was fascinating was around like 20, early 2015, I think that's when we started anecdotally seeing the shift uh, into data. Um, like most of the talks I, I remember, uh, or like 
very few talks in 2014 were related to data. It was like um, a lot of web devs. I think I gave a talk on like PySpark back in 2014. Right. And then we, then like from there though, 2015 and on, like it was just data, 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 data. Um, to the point where I think overwhelmingly now, I mean, the talks are related to data, but that's what Python, I think the perception of it is. And obviously it's a language that encompasses a lot of things, but locally it's, at least it's anecdotally what I see. I might, maybe I'm totally off base, but. Um, well, I don't think you're off base at all. Right. Because like the, the plots that I've been showing from the developer survey, I mean, data analysis, right there at the top, some of our discussions we've been talking about for these other comparisons where web is in this weird space where it's got a, it's got a solid foundation, but it's not the innovative thing right now. Whereas in data, all the innovation around machine learning is in Python. And so it's really got that going for it. Well, the fascinating uh, thing is too, a lot of the innovations in, in the machine learning are actually under the hood in the um, C bindings sure. and stuff too, right? Yeah. But everyone realizes like everyone, the users are all writing Python. So they have to right. appeal to the user base. Um, I don't see well, anyone out there writing Lisp, uh, you know, Lisp flow or anything that just, that doesn't exist. So. I, I yeah. think there's a couple things touched on, but I, I do want, I have one question for Adam. Are you running your R notebooks in a Jupyter notebook? Like, is it based on Python notebook? Oh, that's you... my, okay. So studio, I hate right? Jupyter notebooks. I like Python, uh, R notebooks out of um, the using Knitter because they're, they're plain text based and you're building that report and you're building a separate, I run this, here's my source code. My output is something totally different. Um, whereas IPython notebooks are just a blob of JSON and doing any sort of Git or diff on that is, I think there's a GitHub plugin, but I've never gotten a company that uses GitHub. So, um, I've tried that GitHub. I've tried thing. that. I've tried that diff tool that and and the dime or and dime or something like that. Something like, yeah. I struggled with it, and and now what I do actually, I saw this trick where you can create a save hook, and so when the notebook saves, you save out a Python .py file. And you can do diffs on the dot .py okay. file, but I go. definitely that's... I know that this is I understand that's a pain point, and uh, Ferris yeah R actually has did R yeah, come I... up with its own thing before no nope, Jupiter I yeah think it... I think R had notebooks yeah, before well, there wasn't yeah. a Jupiter R, R though. had stuff yeah R, 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 had, R, R studio. had notebooks yeah that it actually had a a, a system called Knitter that was used to embed, uh, do literate programming in LaTeX documents. And then <laughs> Markdown became a thing. And we all went, that's way better. <laughs> Let's go <laughs> Who wants to there. write LaTeX? <laughs> when I was camping out in Coursera back in 2014, I, I noticed uh, there was this guy I was um, sitting next to and he actually was the one who wrote our notebooks for Jupyter. And he wrote it for funsies. Um, cause that's what people do around there, I guess. So, so yeah, that was interesting. What, so one note he, with he liked Jupiter so much. He wanted R in there instead of Python. I don't know why. <laughs> so. Sorry to step on you, Joe. Um, what one note that your observation with, with the years of 2014 and machine learning. And, uh, when I was a student of cognitive science about you know, longer than 12 years ago, a lot of these machine learning uh, especially image recognition tools, they were not anything more than a white paper, right? They weren't anything more than something, some journal article that still hadn't really been productionized or that accessible. And if it was, it was usually very proprietary. Um, that's, that's just a, an observation. Well, I mean, I, when I, got, I got into machine learning around 2010. And back then you had, um, what was it? Mahout was the big one. That was a Java uh, framework at the time. And that was really the only thing you had for machine learning back then. That was at least somewhat maintained and open source. Um, and how is now, I was now, I've a pain in the ass to work with, honestly. Um, so I think SKLearn was just starting to come on the scene around then. But again, back then, Python had no mind share at all for machine learning. It was like, I remember, I remember I was at this machine learning startup back in 2012 and we were, you know, we we're working on AutoML 
and, and the, the researchers I was working with were like, yeah, well, any serious a machine learning person is going to use Java. Like nobody uses Python. That's that you would have to be like a, you know, basically insinuating you have to be a joke of a person to try to consider using Python. Um, and so anyway, I, I wrote this whole data muncher and uh, pandas back then. Um, and they're like, huh, that's kind of cool. And I was like, yeah, because it's really fast and it works and stuff. And it saves you guys like all the time of cleaning data. And, um, you know, so that was when I realized like the power of Python. I mean, that's, that's, uh, I, got, I got into Python like 2009 or 2010, but then kind of detoured from it for a bit. Cause I was like, well, nobody, no serious person's going to use Python, right? For anything. But then I then I found uh, then I found pandas um, and then I was like well okay I guess we'll give this another shot I was like holy crap sold and then it's from there forget about it. I remember the discussion back in 2010 for me was trying to find alternatives to MATLAB for people who didn't want to run MATLAB. Oh gross! You had Octave. Right. There weren't that many uh alternatives i just i i was uh curious about python in the first place so i was like why don't we just write some of these stuff in python and that was before i knew linear algebra was really hard um i have another question um because i i find this to be kind of a limitation of python with data and that's at the big data scale um so i currently use uh spark and uh like uh basically PySpark, um, and I hate it. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's the worst. Well, tell um, us more about that. What do you hate so, about it? So, so part of your problem, maybe, and, and I'm just going to throw this out there too, like <laughs> distributed systems suck, right? But also your abstraction can, can make it easier or harder. Well, I mean, tell us what your pain points are, though. What don't you like about things like PySpark? So I think my pain point is the back end's written in Java, the front end's in Python. And so debugging mm. any sort of error is just like, it, it's like, I, I don't know what, what I'm supposed to do with half the errors I get. Um, and I, I, like, mm. I rely on the Python debugger, uh, can't do it. Uh, it's just like my favorite tools that I like in development become very challenging to use. Uh, while working, while working in the uh, Spark ecosystem, I don't know. I, I I'm curious, like what other, what other people's experiences are like, and uh, if they use other things. I hate that user-defined functions in PySpark are so slow and so hard to write and maintain. That, that is crazy making. Yeah, you almost have to be good at just writing. Scala, <laughs> so yeah, yeah UDF, so I, that'll never be a thing in there, unfortunately. But, but I think like when you start having like this is what this is an issue we have at our company where we have Scala code, we have uh, Java code, or, or just more native Java, and then we have Python all doing working within the same like Spark clusters, um, and it's just like you don't know where to go to look for things. It's just a. Let me ask a, you though, kind of what kind of problems are you trying to solve? Um, we use it for data munging. So walk me through that. Like what, what does that look like? Um, so we, I guess, uh, we have pretty large data sets. We look at every product that is being viewed on like 140 different big retailer sites. Uh, we get it all, uh, uh, we're just dumping it into parquet files and we're then trying to use it for various, um, types of. Let's, let's say like recommendation systems or uh, other, other uh, okay. machine learning style problems. Got it. Yeah, hit me up in a, in a message. I, I have some ideas for you. So happy to chat offline. All right, so we spent a good amount of time on that one. I had this question, um, but I think we'll just go on to an open floor. Um, we're at about two hours, so let's uh, just give this, if anybody has some closing questions, um, do about seven minutes and then wrap up the, wrap up our discussion here. Um, if anybody does want to ask the previous one, they can. Um, if we want to talk more about big data and Python, we can. Well, 
the thing I see is it's interesting. I, I, I see like on the, on the uh, notion of like pie spark, for instance, has been interesting that because um, I think the notion of like a big data lake, sorry, I'm just watching my family do something to my yard. Um, weird. So um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, I think kind of stepping back and, and looking at the tool set, what I see a lot, in a lot of cases is like the, the notion of a data lake and spark in general um, is, is starting to maybe see some challenges or maybe some reappropriation, if that's the correct way of phrasing it. Because I think with new data warehouses, for example, like Snowflake or even BigQuery, for example, like any structured data problem in Redshift, I mean, you could, you could put a lot of your data, maybe not so much Redshift, um, but I know with Snowflake and BigQuery, separating compute from storage means that you can run, um, you can get back to good old SQL and solve, I think, most of your problems that way. I, I don't know that um, when I see people using PySpark, uh, with the exception of using MLlib uh, for machine learning, in a lot of cases, I, I don't know why they're using it anymore. Because if you put your data into BigQuery or Snowflake, you can effectively do the same thing and way faster. And uh, I'd argue maybe cheaper too. So, um, but so it's interesting seeing the use cases for PySpark, um, I guess, change from what it used to be because it, it used to be with big data, you had to write either MapReduce code or um, then Spark in the, in the early or the mid uh, 2000 aughts. And now it's, I think it's, it's weird seeing the reversion back to data warehousing actually, like kind of second generation because now new data warehouses are treating like the, the data like kind of a data lake 2.0 almost. It's been, anyway, an observation um, that may or may not affect uh, where big data tools go um, with the exception of machine learning, so. I've also kind of seen that, that uh, transition too. So we do use Snowflake and when I can, I do everything in Snowflake because it's just so elegant. What's one of the interesting things that I've seen, we, we use Databricks as a, uh, as a vendor for managing our Spark clusters. Uh, they are now, they've created a new product called uh, Delta. Uh, yeah, exactly. Databricks Delta. Uh, and it's effectively supposed to do that same sort of thing, but it's still very new. And one of my teammates is um, on the advisory committee for uh, like the, the customer use of it. Um, so we're adopting it, but I do like, I don't know. I have all these conflicts in my head. Like, I've had bad experience with PySpark. I don't, if I can avoid Databricks, I, I do uh, use Snowflake where I can, but it's like we jump between the two. Yeah, it, it, the ecosystem is getting interesting. I mean, I'll be able to comment on some of this stuff too. I mean, like Kubeflow is another one I see kind of gaining a lot of traction at the expense of, um, you know, Spark. Uh, but feel free to comment if you want on that. Well, you know, you can deploy some pretty good machine learning models straight out of BigQuery. That's true. So why go through all the trouble of setting up a Spark cluster if you have a lot of structured data? That's exactly it. Yeah, I mean, I, I know with one, one company we were working on, they wanted the data lake because all their uh, devs are really good at Spark. And then they started using BigQuery and uh, none of them want to use Spark. <laughs> so cause it's just like, uh, why? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, we see that actually. And it's not because we do a lot of work with Google. I mean, it's just because that's just how it is. Um, people are just, people are naturally lazy and they'll take the path of least resistance because that's how it goes. So. And query is also just so easy. It's so easy. Can you say a little bit more about how uh, BigQuery works and like why, um, yeah, w what is so easy? Joe, well, you should send him the, the YouTube hmm. from the data engineering meetup because I will. she went through this, this is worth your time. Yes. It definitely yeah. is. I mean, I'll just I'll put it to you this way. BigQuery is, um, I would say, there's, you give it your data. It doesn't matter how big your data set is. I really don't care how big your data set is. Like, it doesn't matter. Um, let's say, for instance, you had like 20 petabytes just for fun. Um, you can throw that into BigQuery and you need to do nothing else. You don't need to set up any infrastructure, manage any infrastructure. You just simply, once the data is loaded, you can start writing select statements and start getting, going to town. It also does machine learning. I think that blew Dylan's mind when he saw that. You could write machine <laughs> learning code in SQL. Um, you could run XGBoost and TensorFlow in SQL. 
uh, you can kind of do whatever the hell you want, frankly. You can do geospatial queries. You can, you can like do joins on geospatial data sets, which is yeah. freakishly weird, but you can it's do that. Bonkers. So, yeah. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll send you a video. Um, I think it, it would be worth your time to look at it. Like I said, what, every time we show a big query, people are just like, um, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> So, I mean, I, 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 I gave a, I gave a, a course on PySpark over an ILS company one time. Um, I think they just like BigQuery now, <laughs> so, as far as I can tell. I don't know what you're doing, but. We'd been using BigQuery before. It's useful yeah. to dump data in very quickly. Um, awesome. We did try to use Py, Spark, a Spark cluster to automate some batch jobs for inference, and we actually found that building our own on top of Kubernetes worked a lot better, easier, cheaper, and we could use GPU nodes, which upfront are more expensive, but because the computation jobs were so much shorter, with GPUs we're actually saving money. Yeah, and, you oh, yeah know, we, haven't, we haven't touched on Kubernetes at all, actually, in this whole talk, which is like the dark horse. That's our bread and butter, though. You know. Our, full companies built on Kubernetes at this point, mm -hmm. I think. Also, Spark doesn't really handle streaming all that well, so it's got some competitors coming up behind it for handling streaming use cases. I'd say if you're doing um, analytics on uh, streaming, I mean, Druid's an obvious one to look at. Um, but uh, yeah, there's quite a few new entrants in that field. BigQuery handles streaming data too, so. Yes. <laughs> Cool. Um, well, <laughs> I think maybe we'll wrap up there for anybody that uh, wants to jump off. Um, that we just have somebody who just joined. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming. And Ferris, if you want to say anything, I think Ferris has to jump off here soon, too. He's got the new little one. Yeah, it's sunset, so Felix decided that it's time to cry. Um, yeah. <laughs> please uh, join. Come on, buddy. I'm trying to talk here. Please join the uh, the meetup Slack, um, the one for today. If you are in there, I can do the drawing uh, based on that. Dylan, do you want to walk him through the drawing? Right now? The, we, I'll probably do the raffle asynchronously because Felix is losing his little mind. Okay. But if you can yeah. walk him through what it is. A raffle, um, essentially we give away books and um, raspberry pies that um, we use the funds to help motivate that and sort of spread knowledge around. Um, it looks like we have some sort of new raspberry pie Awesome. Um, Ferris, we use Python to randomly choose somebody from the group. And so uh, I think Ferris is going to do that, put that in our channel. Everybody give them a little thumbs up uh, when that happens. Um, yeah. Any questions on the raffle? It's a raffle. How are we going to get prizes to us? I think he's going to mail them. OK. So. After, he'll contact you, and you'll provide mailing addresses, and things will get shipped to you. <laughs> All right. I am going to stop our recording. I'm going to leave the chat open for a bit. I'm probably going to hang out for a bit if people want to keep talking. Um, otherwise, thanks, everyone, for showing up. Um, it's been great. Round of applause. We can do this. That was really sad. Sorry, I was trying to respond, <laughs> but I was in the other room. I will be mailing those out when people get them to uh, the to the winner. I think I'm going to pick two, um, and I will paste that in the channel uh, because a lot of people weren't able to stick around for the whole thing. Um, I literally all I do is I do slash who in uh, Slack. I copy that, and then I use a comma. Uh, to separate it out, and then I use random dot choice. So, I will paste all the, I will paste my work, and maybe do a screen, 
share of it, like a, a screencast, just a fun with little GIF. So, yep. Uh, thanks everybody for coming.